speaking of not wearing deodorant, I, I smell very badly. Oh. So are you going to go put some on? I think, honestly, the reason I smell those is because I've been using the Dove body wash that's in the shower at the beach house. I don't have my dial bar. You're a bar man. Yeah. I'm a man. I'm not wearing Dove body wash and with lotion built into it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into this, guys. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to New Heights. Hey. Presented by Wave Sports and Entertainment and brought to you by our friends over at Fireball. Man, you guys, you guys bring this to everybody and we want to bring Fireball to everywhere we go because it's so goddamn good. I say goddamn good, not goddamn good. Uh, we are your hosts. I'm Travis Kelsey. This is my big brother, Jason Kelsey, out of Cleveland Heights, Ohio. <laughs> Northeast Ohio, shout out. New episodes come to you every single Wednesday. We're a little late this week because uh, we're in Philly and we're getting ready for Beer Bowl. So sorry we're getting this to you a little late, but uh, glad we got it to you. Subscribe on YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts, and follow the show on all social media platforms at New Heights Show with one S. Jason, tell them what we got coming up. We got a great episode, as always. God damn it. That's we are right. Good. We're going to get to everything you need to know that happened at Tight End U. Ooh. We're going to touch on, of course, our Not Dumb questions submitted by all of our 92 percenters. And most importantly, we're going to get to our guest today, Mr. Alejandro Villanueva. Woo-hoo. Man, I don't know if uh, Dos Equis is still doing those most interesting man in the world commercials. But if they are, we got the real one right here. Yeah. But first, before we get to our guests, we're going to get to Out of the House. Get out of the house. I don't know if you could guess what the Out of the House is, but it's Travis going to Nashville, Tennessee for tight end U. Out of the House is brought to you by our friends at Pup Peroni. It's great to leave the house, but when you return home, be your best friend's best friend and give them some Pup Peroni, the original meat snack treat, whatever they call it. It's delicious. <laughs> 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 with a snort. Oh gosh, I crack right myself now. up sometimes. Uh who who'd you meet? Uh I met Dalton Kincaid. Dalton. Dalton Kincaid, rookie out of Utah. Nice. He's playing a uh, first round draft pick to the Buffalo Bills. It's a tight end? Draw yeah, he's drawn well, yeah, he's drawn some comparison to, you know, maybe being that hybrid uh receiving you know, really good receiving tight end. Mm. Um, Do you have a lot of questions for you? Did, did he pay attention? He didn't ask class? me one single question. Didn't ask you anything. No, guys had his wits about him. I'm not gonna lie. He, um, did he, he ask was, any questions? He looked like he was uh, just absorbing everything. You know, as a not rookie, a big question guy. Yeah, most. I mean, when I was a rookie, it's I wasn't a asking sign. a lot of questions. I was just trying to figure it out. Who else did fuck you? Were it up. any quarterbacks there? Uh, yeah, we had Josh Allen, Sam Darnold. Um, who else Jesus. showed up? Uh, yeah, we had some good QBs. Is it just um, a happenstance? That you, Trey Lance. You had two quarterbacks, three quarterbacks that also could have played tight end? Yeah, literally all three of them, huh? That would have been great tight ends. Yeah, those dudes are great athletes. Man, it's a lot easier playing tight end than it is quarterback, guys. It doesn't work <laughs> out for you. It was cool. I, in, in terms of, like, meeting guys, I'm pretty familiar with the, the majority of the guys uh, in the league playing tight end nowadays. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did, uh, I did get to see Rob Gronkowski talk about some football, man. man. Fuck it. What do you you want to talk about nuggets of gold, man. What was the biggest thing he gave you that you took away from his? It sounded like he was just the ultimate fucking teammate, man. He was just so willing to do whatever the team needed him to do at any moment and making sure that he was always so ready. Unselfish. Very unselfish dude, man. Uh, I mean, that sums up Rob Gronkowski if I've ever heard a word. Yeah. It was awesome hearing him talk ball and just talk about how you need to be in the building and how accountable you need to be and the desire that you need to have to uh, to be that especially when you got you know great players around you you got yeah. a chance to win you know what i mean yeah so it was awesome hearing him and talk through some plays on uh, on the on the screen is he talking through run plays routes dude he was talking he was talking through really what was rob gronkowski's like greatest plays highlight tape so it was like a some of the stuff and it was just fun watching him all right here's what you're gonna want to do you're gonna want to stiff arm the shit out of this db and uh (laughs) throw him five yards up the field and there was a mentality he he would talk about every time having that yeah no he um he would use his size obviously him talking through using his size and just Mm -hmm. tight ends being able to use their size and route running and yeah and things like that and when you have the ball we were talking to yeah i mean it's, it's fascinating stuff i love to hear everything what did you teach uh, the tight ends. Dude, I found out that I found this out three years ago, really. I'm not a great teacher. You're not a great teacher? No, I'm not a great teacher. I think that I can teach, but when I watch myself on video teach, I'm like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? I think you're giving yourself a little bit of a, you know, not the right amount of credit. I've, I've heard from other tight ends on our team that have went, they said that you actually have some really pointed things about coverages and 
why you run routes and things. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, at least it, uh, at least it registered for somebody. They said. It's difficult for me to be able to, you know, articulate kind of how uh, how I like to look at the game and how I like to do it because I've never sat there and tried to make it make sense. It just makes sense for me, right? Yeah. So to be able to, to, yeah, being able to, I don't know, discuss that in front of a group and have everybody in the room understand it and let alone have them understand it but be able to take that with them. Take, mm-hmm. take what I'm saying and be able to translate it into their game. Years past, I talked about a lot of, you know, what we do in Kansas City and kind of what I'm the, the I don't want to say the... Um, the adjuster? Yeah, I don't want to say the adjustments that I make, but the, the ability for me to um, have the freedom. go off script. Yeah, yeah, the freedom that I have in my offense. Guys don't have any freedom in their offense, Until let alone if you're trying to... It works. All right, now, that's what I'm trying to tell them. Did Andy give but, you that, or did you just kind of no, try it out? No, he did not. I like, think Coach right. Reed... Uh, I feel like that's the way it works. Like, J.J. Watt, nobody has a license to backdoor tackles on the outside, on, on zone plays. Unless you're Until getting you the tackle you make a bunch of tackles for loss, I'm like, hey, why don't you keep doing that? Yeah, no. <laughs> um, I would say I, I did that more in practice than I did in games. You, you, you definitely know I mean? want to try I, it out in practice. Yeah, you do not want to do this in games, dude. Bold move, try it in the middle yeah. of the game. Basically, I'm not afraid to get yelled at during practice. But I would I would tell them things that I did that kind of, you know, make me a better player, and they didn't have that freedom in, in their offense to be able to sure. do it. Or at least they were trying to make the team to where they didn't want to use the reps that they were getting to, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know screw up or maybe do something unscripted yeah so i tried to make this year a little bit more of uh like how to channel your own professionalism and uh and and just give kind of keys and notes of what i how i like to run certain routes versus certain coverages so i i don't know i try to make it more relatable for everybody in the building or everybody in that room instead of just kind of directing it towards the the style of tight end that i am yeah all right well um are you and Darnell Washington friends now? I did not see Darnell Washington up there. Was he He's there? He's not up there? I don't, I don't think know. he was up there. Maybe he just didn't go to your seminar. I didn't mean it. May I didn't meet him. <laughs> I don't think I met him. Did you learn to block? Yes. <laughs> I finally figured it out. <laughs> I got my towel drill. I got my... Towel drill. drill? What's towel my, drill? It's, it's the Kittles, you know... You grab the towel? No, no. Towel's on the floor. Towel's on the floor? Yeah. What it's the fuck a, are you going to do with the towel on the floor? You got to, it sets your angles. It, it helps you with footwork and being able to, you know, set your angle on a certain defender, whether you're running inside so zone or outside drill. zone. Basically, yeah. But with a towel? Yeah, because you can do that anyway. You can do towel drills anyway. You can't, you, not everybody has a board a at the house. Yeah, there you go. But yeah. Yeah. Same so, premise. I'm, I'm going to use that to my advantage this year. I just don't need a towel either. Don't need a towel or a board. Well, Jason, that's why you're the fucking number one center in the National Football League, because you hey. don't need that kind of stuff. A guy like me, <laughs> not in the top five tight ends, because I can't fucking block. <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> oh, my gosh. Do you have anything else to add from tight end you before we end this segment? Like, Dude, it's so much fun. I just want to thank all the guys for coming out. Man. Is it fun because you're teaching tight end you, or is it fun because it's in Nashville, Tennessee? It's fun because the everybody really does get out, come out, go out there with the intentions of gathering as much information as possible. Like the like how everybody, their attention, the questions, the atten- like the the ability to go out there, work out, sweat, really kind of get after their craft yeah. and try and get better. I think that's what makes tight end so much fun. And then on top of that, yeah, the parties are free at the end, and we raise a lot of money for a lot of good causes. I got to admit, you got a trophy for a tight end you this year, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, and I was I was a little I was a little wasted when they shouldn't they give out me. diplomas? What are they giving out trophies? Yeah, so they gave out trophies. Uh, everybody in the group decided to or voted on who was kind of like the number one uh, tight end, or uh, I forget what the actual trophy's name was. But basically, yeah. So in your head, the trophy was just I'm the best tight end, but that's not what the tra- actual trophy was. I think that's what it was. <laughs> I didn't get to take it with me. They, they said they're going to engrave my name on one and get and send it to me. So nice. Yeah. Again, I was a little, was a little drunk. I think that about wraps up tight end you. As you can see, a lot of riveting conversations and good uh, tight end topics where they talk blocking, <laughs> route running, catching balls, and of course, drinking. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get to our guest now. Mr. Alejandro Villanueva. Something way more exciting and interesting for Jason. Everybody give it up for Jason <laughs> for ruining another segment. All righty, we're going to get back to the show in a second, but first got to shout out our partner. 
Fireball. Mm, fire, but that's cinnamon delight. It takes any game event anywhere you go to the next level. Mm-hmm. Even church. Jason, are you a big fireball guy? Fireball's iconic cinnamon taste. Tastes fire and goes down easy, making it the ultimate crowd pleaser. That's why it's the number one shot in the country at church. <laughs> what I really like about the fireball shooters is that you can put it right in your coat pocket and take it to church. <laughs> Just crack it open, knock it back. Jason, please tell me you're a fireball guy. Huge. It's the number one shot in the country for a reason. Just crack it and enjoy it. You can purchase fireball wherever you get your fine spirits. And Bible. (laughs) (laughs) We also need to shout out one of our sponsors. You probably see us drinking all the time during the show, and that's Accelerator Active Energy Drink. Shout out! to accelerator yeah gets the metabolism going Uh Mm, and gives you the enhanced focus you need to record a podcast boy do i (laughs) you gotta check out accelerator active energy accelerator active energy is available nationwide to target mayor and uh, uh sheets go get some of that shit and fuel yourself the right way burst your star mango your orange lime your lemon your nade Berry lemon your nade. Lime. What's the cherry lime m- made? Is that it? Made your cherry lime. <laughs> made lime. Lime made your cherry. Mm. Today, we are joined by a man that grew up in Spain, graduated from West Point Academy, served three tours <laughs> in Afghanistan, was an army ranger, and it all earned him a bronze star. And if those life achievements weren't enough for one person in their lifetime, he then decided to play in the NFL for eight seasons, making two Pro Bowls with the Pittsburgh Steelers as one of the best left tackles in the NFL. 92 percenters! Yeah, it's a big one this week. (laughs) 92 percenters, please welcome Mr. Alejandro Villanueva! Is Is that good emphasis? For being in Philly? Dude, yeah, it right. passes. What it else? Passes. It wouldn't yeah. pass in Spain. You, you're. What else are you gonna do in this life, dude? Dude, he's a fruit farmer now. I'm a fruit farmer. Yeah, take it over the farming industry, perhaps. Uh, perhaps. But, no, but I don't think I don't think any of the you know the resume sounds a lot better than what it actually is, for sure. No, dude, that sounded pretty fucking sweet. All righty, we're gonna get to the new news. As always, we hit it with a new news. New news. We ask all of our oh, guests shit. to do their own new news. So we got to hear your new news. My new news. chime. My new news? Yeah, your new, you know, whatever you want to say. Yeah. The Wagner Group uh, having a attempt of a uh, coup. Oh, my God. This is Russia? going in another direction I, I was not prepared it, for. Yeah, is that new, new news? It's no, definitely it new it news. Is. I mean, we're that's gonna, new we're news. We're going to to jump the segment off, though. <laughs> we're, he's going to say new news. I'm going to say new news. And then you're going to hit your chime of the new news. new news. We can go back to the Wagner Group. Though. Yeah, we can. Do you I would be curious to... But do you want me to say new news? Yeah, yeah. that's it. That's, that's okay. essentially pretty... what he was getting into. New news. All right, back new to the news. Back to the Wagner group. <laughs> yeah. So you're a farmer now. I am a farmer. You played eight seasons in the NFL, served in the military, overseas, and now you farm fruit in Florida. How is that going? What should what do you have to tell us about the farming industry that you've learned so far? I feel like it's a very broad question. Yeah. I mean, Let's see how you answer it, and we'll see if I narrow it down. <laughs> yeah. I feel like the transition out of the NFL is extremely difficult. Mm-hmm. It's very similar to the transition out of the military, for example, where you have to find a new identity. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that uh, farming has always been in my family. I think that farming is uh, something that I've always considered very noble and something that the United States has always considered our priority yeah. to make sure that we don't uh, depend on other countries to feed our people. And so for me, farming uh, has been a passion that I've always had. And uh, in South Florida, uh, represents a very niche type market that offers tropical fruits that are not offered anywhere else in the United States. And so for me, it's been an incredible transition. And so I'm very excited about this new chapter of my life for sure. What is the biggest perk of owning a fruit farm? Besides eating a lot of fruit. I think that's the biggest farm. <laughs> but I, no, I, I think that, you know, as a football player, you're always in tune with fans and what the fans want. You know, if you have a good game, you'll get certain feedback. If you have a bad game, you have a different set of feedback. But when you're creating a product that people consume, 
you're hearing a different type of feedback and you're appealing to a very specific type of consumer mm -hmm. and you learn about the consumer markets. And so you, you get embedded for the first time into the economy, not as a product, you know, as in like, we want to buy your jersey and we want to see you catch touchdowns and do the little Dougie, you know, hey. we, we want to, hey. we want for the first time to, to, to consume what you're producing and we want to evaluate you on, on, on the type of products that, that, that you're making out of your farm. And so obviously being in a subtropical area like Miami, Florida and, and, and appealing to the uh, the community of Miami is, is extremely interesting because you can con connect with your community and you can connect with, with a consumer market that is, uh, that is very interested in what you have to offer. Damn. This guy, it sounds like you're pretty buttoned up already, dude. No, no, no. Sounds just, like you're about to kill it. This episode's about to launch before the 4th of July. You told me before you, we agreed to do this or whatever that you're going to Spain for the 4th of July. Do you always go overseas for the 4th of July? Like, is there... Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, or however you want to frame it, I'm still on the NFL schedule. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Taking July off as a month to relax. I guess now I can go in August. You know, I guess <laughs> I, guess I can go anywhere Man. I want. Yeah, uh, it's crazy to think but I've about. always found to be extremely rewarding to celebrate Fourth of July in Europe. You know, why is that? Rub it in their face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, but I actually That's an American answer right there. I do. <laughs> I, I, I I've always celebrated for the. Well, I've, I've always seen the celebration of Fourth of July happen in my hometown of Rhode Naval Station, which is a joint base between the Spanish Navy and the American Navy, and they put in a big show, fireworks, all the things that they've historically done in the United States. And so for me, it's always awesome to not only be in my hometown in the in the hot months of July and August, which are extremely popular, mm -hmm. uh, but also be around the U.S. military. Military, which is, you know, for me, sort of like my my, my first home mm -hmm. uh, out That's there. Awesome. I feel very uncomfortable when I'm in the civilian environment, when I'm inside the confines of a military installation. Always feel extremely comfortable at home. At home, always. That's awesome, man. How many places have you lived? So Miami is the 18th city that I lived in, and so I lived in 18 cities uh, for six months or longer nice. uh, throughout my life. Dude, I've. I admire that. I love traveling. I love being, I love playing in different play. I like just getting out of the house. This guy, he could stay in one city for the rest of his life. Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Philly. That's all I got. Right. I mean, three. Yeah, well, I've got three. I've been in the Midwest my whole life. Right. I mean, I, I, I do feel like a lot of military kids will, will say, you know, it's, for me, it's 24 or 30, you know, yeah. they've just been moving around throughout their whole entire lives. You know, I grew up in a military environment, and then when I became an adult, I served in the military. So I was always constantly moving from one place to the next. It almost seems that I can never stop moving to a different place. After two years, you almost feel like your body's saying, like, okay, what's next? You know, where am I going yeah. next? But I think I settled in South Florida. South Florida's been incredible to me. It's been an amazing place, a lot of culture, a lot of people from different places. And so hopefully I can, hopefully I can give my kids a little bit more stability that I... Did not have growing up. I respect it. All right, we got to get to um, keep this thing moving, man. Yeah, as you as you've already noticed, this isn't a, an actual interview. We just sit down and we chat and talk it up and uh, talk about some bold topics, man. See what you're up to. And uh, Jason, why don't you start them off here with uh, some of the, some of your time with the Eagles, man? My first love. Yeah, I figured we would start with your first stop. Well, it wasn't my first stop. My first stop was actually Cincinnati. Yeah, I got invited to go to the. But that was right after college, right? That was actually. During college. Was it during college? Yeah. So at the, at the military academy, you graduate usually uh, late May, and rookie mini camps happen a little before that. So I don't know how I got invited to go to a rookie mini camp with Cincinnati. Jermaine Gresham was the first dog. round pick. Carlos Dunlap was the yeah, second round another pick. Another dog. Gino Atkins. Was that was a good draft class. It was. It's an incredible yeah. draft class. And I remember it's kind of crazy because, you, as, as you both know, and you probably forgot about this but your rookie mini camp and showing up to the airport and getting picked up by the by the team staff oh, yeah, and, get and, bus, and get into your get locker it's such an incredible and, and surreal moment you know take a was, picture of your locker with your name on right it. right right yeah of course so that was for me in cincinnati you nice. know and i had my locker right next to carlos dunlap and i was able to to become you know acquainted with with such an incredible group of men uh and, and that was my first experience then after my first deployment, uh, I went to uh, the Chicago Bears. Yeah. Uh, Sean McKellen was the first round pick. Mm -hmm. uh, Sean Jeffries was the second round pick. And so for me, it was like a, as a tight end, by the way. Oh, yeah. Both of these oh, were yeah. tight end, right? Both of these were tight end. I played wide receiver in college my last year. Yeah. And so because I played wide, uh, tackle as well in college. So I played defensive end, tackle, and wide receiver. Tight end seemed to be the best uh, combination of all three. It spread. sounds like you could do it all, and that's when you when you can do it all. They just put you at tight end. They put and you at tight end, right? But then my first actual uh, <laughs> my first actual opportunity to, to to make it into an NFL roster was 
with Philadelphia. And I, and I say it was my actual first, you know, chance because it was longer than a rookie mini camp. And so I was at camp with the Eagles, obviously where I met Jason. Yeah. And it was an incredible experience. I mean, I know that for you, you, you you've probably seen so many players go through no, your entire way life. Different. Way different. No, 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 no. But for me, I for, promise you, because you were that first OTAs, you had just got there. You were two hundred and what sixty pounds when you first showed up. Yeah, just like maybe. Just like that, yeah. And um, they said you were playing D end. You were an Army Ranger. You served three tours in Afghanistan. So way different, right from the right, right from there. You were still in the mode of running. What was it like six miles every morning? Yeah. yeah so yeah. you would be out there, and he would be out there in the morning running laps like around the field, around the state, like all that. And we're like, what's going? Like. This was is it, a was way different condition. You were just you you're were not eating. gonna have to run that many miles playing football. I mean, I, I, I feel like anybody who runs would understand is in terms of there's an addiction to the runner's high, mm -hmm. to being able to run and being into in that mode where you're just like in a, in a subconscious state. But when I was with the, with Philadelphia, I was still in the military. Mm -hmm. So Monday through Thursday, because Chip Kelly did not have OTAs on Fridays. Yeah, two guys were and that was Chip Kelly's offense. Yes, weren't you guys running like 200 plays a For day? For the offense, but the defense they wanted big. Three, four, D, D, N, D, tackle, nose right. words, like okay. yeah. space eaters. There you go, baby. Yeah. So Monday through Thursday, I would go to OTAs, and then Thursday after practice at one p.m., I would get in my car and I would drive ninety-five south all the way from Philly to Savannah, Georgia. Yeah. Through the night, I would show up in the morning to formation. I would have a days of work on Friday, and then on Sunday I would sign out on leave again, just so that my leave time that I have accumulated over the five years that I was in the military mm -hmm. would suffice to be able to complete OTAs and training camp and perhaps have a chance to make it into an NFL roster. Man, that's nuts, dude. But I, I do think that... That's crazy. Chip Could Kelly, you imagine doing that, Jason? No. This is... I've gone I, through I, training camp. I, I've always been terrible. I can't even, like, I can't even breathe, let alone function mentally, and you're out here... Working two shifts. I guess, how did you end up in Philadelphia? Was it Billy Davis? Was it Jerry Azanero? Was it Chip Kelly? Like, how did you end up in Philly? Okay, so when I got when I got done with my third deployment uh, with the Rangers, I came to a I came to a realization that, I mean, I, I don't know if this is controversial to say, but I, I, I knew that we were not going to win or have a clear, decisive victory in Afghanistan. Okay. And so at that point, the Army was having a what's called a BRAC movement. So they were reducing the size of the force. So each brigade in the army, we have nine divisions. So each division was downsizing from four brigades to three brigades. I know this is all going over your head, but what it means is that they were down, the army was downsizing. Yeah. And when you downsize, you're going to have an excess of officers. And so my, my time in the army, I spent it all in the infantry, uh, try to be as close to the action as possible. And when it was time for me to transition to my next career next phase, yeah. my, my phase, I had to wait 18 months to get command because I went to a light infantry unit. I had to go to a heavy infantry unit. So I had to go to Fort Hood. I had to go, I had to be in a tank. And that obviously, as you can tell, panicked me a little bit. <laughs> and, a little tight. and I just got, and I just got married. And and so I didn't, I didn't know if I wanted to give my, my kids the same experience that I had of always picking up and leaving not having an identity not having a home, not having any of that. And so like most officers that I, that I ever, you know, out of West Point, for example, I think like 75% of officers leave after five years. Really? Yeah. So I mean, it's just, it's a pyramid, you know what I mean? The, the higher you get to the top, the less officers are going to be. So I decided to get out of the military and I wanted to, you know, one of the things that I found out about. You just said, I'm going to join the NFL. No, it's even crazier than that. So one thing that I realized about higher institutions like Harvard, Yale, Stanford, you know, is that you're always competing with your classmates, whether you're at the academy, which you have a rank while you're at the academy yeah. or after the academy, you're always competing. You're always seeing like, how's Jason doing? How's Travis doing? What was your highest rank? My highest rank, so I was, uh, I think I was in the hundreds academically. I was mid of the pack physically, and I was almost dead last militarily, which is the three categories that they were doing. Dead last. Academically, militarily, what's a militarily mean? 
Militarily means they they grade you on how you did on your assignments on uh, as, a, as 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 a leader at the academy. Yeah. So you know the, the you have during the summers your cadre. So you instruct the new cadets on how they should you know behave themselves, how to mm-hmm. march, how to salute, how to how to do all the all the basic drills. And then during the academic year you have. Um, a lot of a lot of assignments too. They could be like you could be the company commander for your company, so you're in charge of all the you know they divide the core cadets into regiments and into companies. Yeah, and so you're in charge of your classmates. You're in charge of their the, the daily activities. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I did not perform as good as I should have in gotcha. those activities. Obviously, I was very focused on 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 football. You also could have just got caught with some absolute knuckleheads. No, I mean I I do think that army football is an incredible. And, and, and very fascinating subculture of the academy. Okay. Imagine if you were a football player and you have your own, va- the values of the locker room in the NFL are very similar to the values in any any NFL locker room. Imagine if Cincinnati, you're like, okay, now you're in charge of these cadets or these students from University of Cincinnati and you have to mentor them and you have to advise them on, and then you have to be in charge of them. Based on how late he was today, I know for a fact that Travis <laughs> would be, you know, the last. second, 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 you know, he, he would be bad bad, 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 <laughs> bad, bad, <laughs> bad, right. I'm not going to lie. You said academics, <laughs> I'm going to be at the bottom of the charts of that no, one but, too. No, but academics, this was my was my strength. Physicality, though. That's physicality. that's where I. That's, well, where I, that's, my, physica- physicality, that's my kind of job, right there. Physicality, you got to run. You got to run long distance. You know? I could, no, I am. A, I'm a long distance runner too. Okay, so I don't run six miles. You play basketball. Basketball. Yeah. I feel like all the basketball players can. Yeah, I was actually lucky that uh, Dad made me be a. Um, uh, athletic trainer the year that I was ineligible for football because the basketball team was forced to be a uh, on the cross country team if they weren't playing a uh, spring go. sport or the, at least go to cross country practice and I was like man good thing dad made me trainer Trav I'm in here taping ankles and handing out water <laughs> <laughs> nice nice yeah yeah so um, do you think that the same structure and leadership styles and teaching styles that work in the military are the best ways to teach players and to take that to football that's an amazing question that i've that i've asked myself many many times yeah. because it's been always hilarious to see how nfl teams utilize the military and use a lot of lingo like we're going to war boys mm-hmm. and like you guys are not going to war you guys are going to game you know it's a little different this is, right. this, is this is you this, this is a hundred percent pseudoscience Pseudoscience. My understanding of what I always tell people, because for me it was interesting, very impactful, you know, as a European coming to the United States and walking into a college football team and seeing how people scream during practice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they pitted each other during practice, like one on ones. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, you know that you've been, that one on ones is like the, oh, I don't want one on ones. <laughs> and so, I love one on ones. When I did a little bit of, Pseudo yeah, research. Running against a DB, it's a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, so yeah. much fun. Little guys running around. Yeah. Oh man, it's the best. Excuse you ever do me. One on one pass blocking. On one yeah. Like With Justin Houston. Is that Tom Ali, my rookie year. That's a good time. Yeah, it was a great yeah, time. <laughs> Learned a lot about myself. <laughs> that was that was actually my first <laughs> start against Tom Ali. It's crazy. Dude. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah. You played with Jay Houston, man. That guy's freaking strong as amazing anybody human ever. being though. Oh, great dude. I love one playing with him. One of my favorite teammates, and I tell you that dude every single time he went up against me, told me as he was running past. Asked me after he just sacked the quarterback again. Just, hey, Kels, you're going to need a few more cheeseburgers tomorrow. <laughs> like, Damn it. Yeah. I had 10 yesterday. <laughs> Fuck. You know, what I, what I thought about football is that football was created out of the lack of war between men in between war periods. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so men, in order to feel themselves as you know, worthy or whatever, they came out with this game of football, which includes a lot of the same concepts as the military. Yeah. And so football and the military have always been, you know, they've, they've used the same values, they've used the same structure. So it's extremely similar. Now, in reality, it's not the same at all. Right. But screaming during a drill, like, why are you screaming during a drill? Because I'm bored. No, but like, that's when the same thing. Adrenaline! <laughs> Let's go. Inducing stress <laughs> into the player in order to it's not good stress no. is good right yeah yeah but anxiety what, is good but that's what they do that's what they do during basic training yeah so when i felt when i was going to to drills and they were screaming like go 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 you're like go 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 that sounds a lot like yeah like like i'm going through basic training so it was very did you have a problem with that type of leadership in basic training i think the military is always ahead of society when it comes to everything i think the military is always because the military truly represents 
the country and the nation. Mm -hmm. And so the military years and years ago, they realized that if you scream it, a millennial, the millennials going to be looking at you and say, bro, what's wrong with you? You know, why are you so angry? Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. It's much better if you explain it to me rather than screaming at me. So the military transitioned before the NFL did. Yeah. In that aspect. And so when I went through training camp with the Eagles and there was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Always, always has. I mean, the, the, if you look at in terms of social progress, the military has always been leading. This. They're usually ahead of the curve. They use it because they have to recruit people yeah. from the American population. And so they mm -hmm. have to understand what the American population wants and needs and how they operate. And then they have to cater their training to them. Yeah. And so when I went through the NFL, I was like, why are you Jerry, like Jerry has an arrow. Like, why are you screaming at me, Bob? I was going to touch on him next. You're, yeah, you're, yeah, you're, yeah. You're a, you're a defensive end at 260. Like, do you think if we would have started you out as an offensive lineman, you would have tied in? Tight end? Tight end. You would have never heard of Travis Kelsey. <laughs> <laughs> Let's don't go, be baby. Don't be You're lucky. No, no, no. I get it. I get it. I get it. I would have flanked my way into another nah, position. No, that's that's baby. my excuse because I never got a chance to play. I did score a touchdown once, but Let's I never. Go. But I never. But you I hit never. That stanky leg. No, I just can't. You the hit the gritty. The, like, I hand the ball to the referee like class. You know, act. Like class act. Act. Exactly. I actually did this hilarious. So I'm in the military. I want to get out. I want to find a way to pay for business school. That's my goal. And then I got two choices. I can either go to American Idol or I can try to the NFL. I'm a horrible singer. And so I decide oh, I because of this, this blackout conversation that I had with my teammates in Savannah, Georgia, they said, dude, they got this thing called the regional combine. And the regional combine, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this or not, but it's, I mean, it, it, it was a scam, basically. It was like opening up the ability to play in the NFL to anybody. What's the scam, though? The yeah. scam is the fact that you're not going to go to the play. <laughs> <laughs> just, so you pay three hundred and eighty bucks. Oh, so they make you pay to get in. They this. make you pay. So when I so it's crazy. I was so naive. They make you pay. For they this? make you pay to run a forty and to do the five shuttle drill and yeah. to do. So when I was in Georgia, I was like, Yeah, I can play in the NFL. You know, why not? And so I I paid this this admission fee and I went to a tryout in Flowery Branch. Atlanta, which is the the the, the Falcons facility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I ran a 40, 515. <laughs> it's an offensive lineman, right? No, no, no. For a tight end. <laughs> and then I ran a couple of routes. I think I dropped one out of three. And then I ran the five five ten, five ten, whatever. And then the the staff at the regional common were like, I mean, you know, we're trying to make a story out of it. Can you can, 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 can you can you can you long snap? You know? Yeah. And I was like, hell yeah, I can slog. I can do whatever you do. Yeah, I can do whatever you do. It all. But somehow it worked out, and I was able to go to the, are you ready for it? Super regional combine. <laughs> which was another, How much is that one? I think it was like $800. <laughs> 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 and it ended up, paying, it ended up paying off in the end. Yeah. But I had to fly to Detroit, and then I did the same exact uh, workout, which is kind of like a, a like a regional, like a, like a combine, the same sure. thing. Sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, you talk about like you have bartenders there that have been watching TV forever going like, I can play in the, I can, I can score a touchdown. You know, you got PE teachers, you got random people just trying out for the NFL. Yeah. So I was one of those guys. Yeah. And when I tried out for uh, doing the original Dude, combine, no, when you walked into that room, did you like look around like, oh, I fucking got this? No, nah, no, nah, I, I, I've, I've, I've never been. I mean, maybe in the back of my head, I was going through the motions, but I knew that it was that I, I knew that it was a scam. I knew that there was no way <laughs> that they were going to have a forty-one-year-old bartender or PE teacher, yeah. you know, play safety for the you know Arizona Cardinals. You know, yeah. it's, it's impossible. You know, it's, it's extremely competitive. And I had the experience of the mini camps to know that you have to be an incredible athlete. Well, I think I think your resume kind of stood out a little bit more than the bartender. And you know what? That's all they were looking for. They were looking for stories that they could promote in this ah, regional man, company to man, encourage other players. So yeah, it, it, it felt a little bit like. That's cryptocurrency dude. type, you know, like, hey, you know what I mean? Like, come on in, you know, try out. You could be, you could be the it's next. great. You could be the next Travis Kelsey. I was like, yeah, hundred million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I tried out for the Super Regional Combine and it just happens to be a scout for the Eagles was there. 
Who? What, do you remember who it was? I completely forgot. I mean, don't put me in the spot right now. The I, scammiest yeah. of the them all. Roseman, right? The Eagles were there. No, no, no. It was, it was Roseman. <laughs> but the fact, the fact, the that fact that I was so in the military just, attracted the Eagles enough. The Eagles sure. just—they searched for stories all day. Dude, there's it, it the was. scammiest. It really, it, re it really was a story, you know. And then so they invited me to do a workout during my block leave, so everything matched. You know, I was able to hide everything from my chain of command. And then I went to Philadelphia, and they were like, "Okay, we're gonna do a tight end workout." So I brought my tight end gloves. You know, they did not do a tight end workout at all. Yeah. I did a, I did a, a, a office alignment workout with Stoutland and he was like, you're too light, you know? And I was like, okay, well, you know, that sucks. And then, <laughs> and then I did, I did a, a, a D line workout and Jerry as an arrow said, I'll take that motherfucker. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> he was like, I'll, you know, I'll take him, I'll coach him. And hey, then, Jerry, you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, it was a great moment, I guess, in my, in my intentions. But all I did when I was in the parking lot after doing the workout was, Google the starting of defensive lineman for the Philadelphia Eagles, and I was like Fletcher Cox. Mm. It's a pretty deep field. Yeah, pretty deep. Remember who it was? Was it was so Benny Trent was Stiller. the nose guard still? Was Benny there? Was it Benny Logan, Fletch, uh, Fletch uh, Vinny Curry, maybe? Vinny Curry, Brandon Graham, was Connor there, yeah. Connor yeah. Barwin, yeah. Nice. and then on top of that, yeah. once I signed this 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 contract, which felt like okay, you mean maybe there's a chance here. Then they signed two defensive linemen and Taylor Hart. Yeah, and Bo Allen. Yeah. So at that moment, I knew that for a fact I was not going to make it, but I was able to stay with the team throughout OTAs in training camp. Yeah. And for me, it was, you know, in this. That's huge, man. Yeah. That's but, huge. but for me, I mean, uh, coming to the United States has always been like a like a movie for me, and being able to be, you know, being in an NFL team and realizing the personalities, the characters, the different places that people are from, mm -hmm. it was. Unbelievable. I think I still remember all the players, you know, that were on the Philadelphia Eagles. Evan Mathis was one of my yeah. favorite human beings that I've ever met. Yeah. Uh, 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 you know, all, all the uh, Jason Peters, you know, going against these players was amazing. But I knew in the back of my head that I was not going to make the roster, you know. And it was very unfortunate because when I accepted and I signed the contract to become a camp body, which is what I was. I knew that I was resigning on my military career that I put so much effort into. So I was an exo. The moment you signed that, you're... The moment I signed that, they, they, they the military initiated a process to separate me from the military. And that's when I started driving back and forth from Savannah to uh, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of like unfortunate, the fact that I couldn't say no to the opportunity to play in the NFL. But at the same time, I knew I was not going to make it in the NFL. I knew they were not going to say, Fletch, you know, great job here, but, you know, like, we got this new player right here from Spain who is three seconds late off the ball every single time. You know? <laughs> yeah, you, you definitely were green. You you had not played in a long time. You you had never played that position. I'm right. trying to figure that out. But you were also one of the first players and probably the only player that I've seen cut. You were cut after the third preseason game or second? Third preseason game. Third preseason game. I was the first player to get cut. Yeah. But you told me about this. So when you got cut, you were one of the first players I've ever seen where other players are like, what are we doing cutting that guy? He's a big, tall, athletic, strong dude. Like, he just started playing football six months ago. Why aren't we giving this guy a longer stint and yeah. seeing what he can do with, like, a full off season? And they tried to come back and sign you to practice squad, I believe, right? Yes. But... You had already signed a deal with the Steelers, right? I was I was in the Steelers office about to sign a practice squad deal and then they call me from the Eagles saying yeah. like hey wanna and I was like, dude, like, I can't say no. I already drove to Pittsburgh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like but it was literally just like that. I was like, I feel bad telling this man in front of me, I'm not gonna sign with you, I'm gonna go back to Philly. But for me it was an incredibly emotional moment because yeah. leaving the military is extremely scary. You know, mm -hmm. you know you 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 no longer have bros around you, which is you take that for granted, you know, to be able to wake up every morning and have, bro, even your, the, the, the person who sits next to you in the locker room, mm -hmm. the person you eat breakfast with. I mean, that's, I feel like that's like one of the biggest problems with men, you know, today. The fact that they don't have bros around you. And when you're in the NFL and you're within oh, all these personalities, I meet your brother. Your brother actually, by the way, was the person that told me that I was going to get cut. I don't remember it like this, but he does. The Eagles told him, Don, the security guy, is he still yeah, there? Dom, yeah, Dom, yeah. Dom, Dom. He told him that I was going to get cut and for the, for, for him to tell me that I was going to get cut. And so after the third preseason game, we played the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, we finished the game and your brother was like, hey, yeah, what are you doing today? You know, oh, yeah, I'm not doing anything. I'm going back to the hotel. I was like, oh, why don't we go out? And we went out to a bar. We got absolutely 
blitz. <laughs> and in the middle, in the middle That's of the third preseason game, not a lot left for the starters. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> in the middle of like the, uh, I love you, man. You're the best dude. He, he just drops out the dude. Like they're going to cut you tomorrow. You know, mm. tomorrow I'm just giving you the warning right now. They're going to cut you tomorrow. And I was like, oh man, like, you mean they're going to keep Fletcher Cox? Like, <laughs> <laughs> what are they thinking? Yeah, what are they thinking? Crazy. <laughs> and so at that moment, it's just, this is crazy. This is like every man's, every Philadelphia person's dream kelsey said dude let's go out tonight <laughs> and, and we're both wearing flip-flops and we're both wearing sure the same outfit he's wearing right now and we went out in philly and i went out, i got the chance i got a chance to go out in philly with jason kelsey you know that's Man, an incredible that's, that's like that's amazing <laughs> everybody knew who he was we got into everywhere i mean for me to realize that philadelphia is the city of brotherly love you know, through Jason Kelsey. I mean, it's incredible. And so the next day, I went to practice, which is kind of a, it was kind of a dick move to let you finish practice. Yeah, it is. But I did, I did recognize, and I want to give out sort of props to Chip Kelly in this. Chip Kelly had a philosophy that he was going to cut players a day before the rest of the NFL in order for those players to hit the portal one day before the rest. Mm -hmm. So you would have a chance to maybe catch on to another team so yeah. the next day i got the, the the finger in the shoulder go grab your playbook you know the hard knock sort of like oh wow this is, seems surreal and it was like a it was like a moment where you're like oh wow like I, is this happening to me you know what i mean like i'm going i'm meeting with all the coaches jerry as an arrow told me that i should join the susquehanna semi-pro football team <laughs> and then it was hilarious how every other person that i talked to that day and this is the only thing that i got away from that day which is a you know, pretty pretty terrible day, especially for most players who end their dreams that day. And they've been playing yeah. football since they were three years old and then they get cut. Every single person that I talked to was like, dude, Al, you did incredible. You did absolutely everything that we asked you for. Like, is there anything that we can do for you? This is, you know, we feel terrible. Is there, is there anything in the world that we can do for you? And I'm like, that's how you know you're doing things the right way, man. No, but I seriously. Sure no, man, can you give me a spot of the team, man? Why are you calling <laughs> There's, there's one thing you can do for well, me. I got it in the back of my head. Yeah. Um, no, that's... Uh, so, that's yeah, so I got cut, and then the next day, I mean, it was, it was like the stereotypical, you know, like they give you Greg, who's the equipment guy, yep. still the equipment guy. Yep. Yeah, I have so many other names. Yeah, yeah, so Greg gives you a black plastic bag, and you go to your locker, and then you pack up all your things. And then you walk out. It was like a summer night like this. It's raining, you know? So you're walking in the rain to your car. And then the media's there taking pictures. Like, first person to get cut. You know, we got a, a former ranger, Villanueva. So you get in your car and you're like, oh, man, this sucks. And then I drove to my I drove to my in-law's house in Maryland. And I was like, well, I'm out of the military and I'm out of the NFL, you know? So, so I guess, you know, tomorrow I'm going to go find a job, you know? But they don't have internet. So I had to go to the public library to go apply for jobs. In the public library, and I'm sitting there filling out my resume. I don't even know how, you know what a resume is. Yeah. And that's when, you know, a couple of days later, that's when the Steelers call me, and they were like, "Hey, you know, we want to bring you in for a workout." And so, you know, that was a, that was a very uh, a huge blessing, I guess, in, in in the whole story. And did they work you out as an offensive lineman right away? No, no. What did so, they start you as? So surprisingly, I got a uh, two quarterback hits. And three tackles against the Steelers. Go, baby. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did well. I, that's why I thought I was going to get caught. I thought Brandon Graham was going to get cut. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> uh, but they, they they worked me out as a defensive lineman. Mm -hmm. Mike Mitchell, who's a, 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 a legendary defensive line coach, you know, I think he, he did the, finish the workout. And he saw that, you know, my potential as a defensive lineman was, was always going to be capped by the fact that I just cannot get off the snap at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and Mike Munchak, who's a... Oh, a yeah, guru, Munch. yeah, Munch. He's just a phenomenal human being. He worked me out. He did a couple of those like combine tests of like, put your hands behind your back and do a set, S squat set, squat, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so when he saw that, he was like, you know, yeah. He said, I, 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 I can use him. And then the next day, you know, I came to practice, had a had a number in a locker, and, and then that was it. I was I was in practice squad. I was reading cards and, you know, go at it. So were you still at 260 or where? where no, were no, at? no. Both Lane Johnson and I were just as insecure about our weight and we were just stuffing ourselves mm -hmm. every single meal oh, trying yeah. to gain as much weight as possible. And so I, I, I went into the Philadelphia Eagles at 265, 260, and then I left the Eagles at around 300. And by the, by the time my, my practice squad year was over, I was at 344. Oh, so you're God. big. You got really big in Pittsburgh. My issue was that I, I did not have the experience and so I remember Chip Kelly made everybody do a heart rate variation, yeah. piss test, and 
wait every single day. Yeah. Now that's a scam. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I, don't know. I, was, I, was, I was following orders. But I remember one day doing the, doing the, the wait behind Jason Peters. And I saw that he was 340. Yeah. And so I said Damn. to myself, <laughs> Jason, Peters, Jason Peters was my, my inspiration. I remember one day we were doing one-on-ones against him. And he said, and he looked at me and he said, I'm going to put you in the trunk. <laughs> and I said, because nobody wanted to go against him one-on-ones. And I was like, the, I'll go against him. I'll show him. <laughs> yeah. I'll give him a move. And he looked at me and he said, I'm going to put you in the trunk. And I said, oh, well, I don't see what you <laughs> mean. But I always thought, you know, I, I looked up to Jason Peters so much. He yeah. was so talented. It was meant to play play the tackle position. Matter of fact, my stance, my sets, everything was after Jason Peters. Right. And so That's I crazy. thought 340 was the weight that you had to achieve because you could overcome a lot of, you know, technical deficiencies if you're just really big. Come on into the big man. Come right, on. exactly. Yeah. So I thought that if I weighed 340, then I would overcome a lot of my, my, my deficiencies in technique that I did not have because I did not play the position for very long. So I always try to gain weight, even though now looking back, it's just, it makes no sense. You know, there's, there's, no, there's no need to be that heavy. You're going you're gonna to obviously get really tired really quick. But 340 was the weight that I had to achieve. So you gained 90 pounds in what, two years? In a year, yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> by, the, by, by, by the time it was... By, by the it time, wasn't a good night. Dude. It wasn't was was a good night. <laughs> Did you feel sloppy? Did you feel... You know, we were talking about it earlier when we were at the bar. It's it's very difficult to recreate pain. It's very re difficult to recreate. And everybody always looks at me and it's like, oh my God, you look amazing. Like, didn't you feel better? It's like, I don't know. You, know, you can't feel... I cannot imagine what I was like when I was 340. I do remember that to use the toilet, I would have to put my hand in between my legs and like lower myself because my knees hurt so much you in the morning. How many times no, did you no. break the seat doing that? No, man, man. No, I, broke, I, I broke absolutely everything. But, but 340... <laughs> 40 was, you know, if you, if you six, not, I mean, another thing that I, that I must say is not beneficial to be so tall playing tackle. Yeah. You, it really isn't, you know, you, 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 you want to have long arms, but you don't necessarily want to be tall. Exactly. I'm not made to be a tackle. I'm made to be a tight end for the Kansas City Chiefs. You know, <laughs> multiple Super Bowls. That's we what could I use you. We could use you. But I was, uh, you know, I, I, I was, I was a little bit too tall. And so for me, I thought that talking about Andrew Whitworth, you know, I yeah. saw the guys in my division was, and I saw, you know what, I got, I got to gain weight. I got to gain weight. But it was a, an obsession that I had when I was playing. It was always to make sure that I was as big as possible to be able to absorb the number one and only move the 99.999% of edge rushers use, which is bull rush. The bull rush. Exactly. All right, we need to take a brief moment to shout out one of our uh, sponsors for this episode. This episode is brought to you by Pup Peroni. All right now. That's right. The original beef-flavored dog treat made for your most valuable pup. Mmm, this sounds extremely delicious. And while your dog can't experience the thrill of competing in a beer bowl, you can inject that same excitement into their life by feeding them irresistible pup Peroni treats. Bring more to the table than just belly rubs and be your best friend's best friend all season long. With the real meat taste of pepperoni original beef flavor snacks. Mmm, that's tasty. Yeah. To learn more, go to pupperoni.com. That's P U P P E R O N I.com. Wolf. So you go to Pittsburgh, especially in the AFC North. That's a bull rush. It's a bull rush. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Or a division. Uh, what, um, so you go to Pittsburgh, first year practice squad. First year practice squad. Second year. Beecham gets hurt, right? That's Beecham's. how you initially got in the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So first year practice squad. I mean, I would have to say that the practice squad year, now looking back, was the most amazing year that I spent in the NFL because I was, I was, I would get two tickets to the game. The Steelers don't allow the practice squad players on the sidelines, so you'd have to sit in the stands. So I would go sit in the stands, get absolutely housed, yeah. you know, yeah. and I would sit like next to my brother and be it's like, like redshirt year in college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just, Throwing that yellow <laughs> tile up in the air yeah, with throwing everybody the yellow else. Tile, I remember Let's go team! Yeah. <laughs> I remember sitting with my brother going like, oh, I know the playbook. This is a pass. And, you know, and they would run fun, the ball. <laughs> <That's fun. laughs> I've seen this one before. I've seen this one. They go, watch. They're going to pass it, you know? Uh, here comes the reverse. <laughs> but it was awesome. It was awesome to, to, to go to the games in Pittsburgh, to yeah. feel the energy, to watch the game from the Football stands. Town, yeah, yeah. 100%. Sports it was incredible. Yeah. To tailgate and, you know, to be able to go to the bars before and after and, 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 and get to experience the city of Pittsburgh, which was the first city that I actually lived in, you know, after the military. So the, the mm -hmm. transit, becoming a veteran is a process. And I thought that there was no better city than Pittsburgh because B Pittsburgh had the highest concentration of Vietnam veterans in the mm -hmm. nation. Really? That's all and I so I, that. it was the, 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 the deer hunter generation. It was either you, gotcha. go to, you go to the mills or you go to Vietnam. Yeah. And so Vietnam, for any infantryman, especially that was 
you know, born in 1988, was kind of like the reference or the, the most romanticized version of an infantryman. You know, huh. all the training that you do in the military was always based on Vietnam, doing a patrol base, river crossings. And I was like, I don't know, there's a lot of rivers in Afghanistan, but, you know, we'll go ahead and, you know, we'll go ahead and Pretty do, dry. Yeah, we'll go ahead and do this. Do, we'll go ahead and do this river crossing, you know, yeah. and whatnot. So it was an amazing year. And then I had a chance to go. I mean, honestly, what I thought made my my career, my confidence to be able to play the, the, the tackle position is the fact that, you know, three days into my practice squad days, James Harrison decides to come out of retirement and join the Pittsburgh Steelers. Mm-hmm. So so I got a chance to go against James Harrison yeah. every single day during practice. And James Harrison is an incredible human being, you know, in his own ways. But he's a phenomenal football player. Leverage. And he has a lot of, and he's very smart, you know. Kent State. Right. And so for me, it, it was really, it was really interesting to learn how to observe an outside linebacker by 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 going against James Harrison, yeah, that to me was 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 incredible. You know, if he knew that the slide was coming, and we're getting a little too technical, but if he no, knew, hey, let's do it. If, if he you knew, knew the slide was coming, if meaning he, the guard has your inside, exactly. What he would do is he would get he would get he would start inching to the inside, so you would not set out. Mm. You know, yeah, he would start getting inside, thinking you're gonna he was gonna do an inside move. Yeah, so and so you were getting not you to stop your feet, getting you to stop your feet. Yeah, and then he would try to do the 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 little the t- rip, lean on you, and then no, the no, no, rip, put the arm down, clamp it, yeah. break your arm, and then spin around and pivot onto the quarterback. For those of you that did not watch James Harrison uh, with any type of technical. Uh, standpoint, he had the most vicious dip and rip move for about a decade. Le- I mean, leverage. he would get so low, he would lock this in, and he was so strong. Super. Strong. Once it was locked in, there was nothing, nothing you could do. do. Scream. Because then he yeah. would just he would just lift you off the ground, and now you're. Well, he did, he actually wasn't as much of a bull rusher as you would think. Yeah, he didn't know? he didn't really go down the middle of guys no. very often. He he would do it occasionally. He would but, set you he would set you up for it. Yeah. And so that's when I started. The dip and rip was his main. That was his main move. That's when like. We're playing Kansas City. He needs to get a sack to win the game. He's going to dip and rip, yeah, and he's going to try to get to the They called the flag that yeah. game. I know which one you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel very privileged to go against a player who was also undrafted and also yeah. had a very unconventional way to get into the NFL. It's incredible. Really. He would never give you any compliments and everything, but he yeah. had his own ways of being able to coach you and, and, and guide you in the right direction. And so for me, I spent a whole year in practice while going against him. Blocking him. Blocking him. And so once I felt that I could block him, and I will say it, if I'd have faced him in a game, hmm I would have blocked him. <laughs> wow, that's a bold statement. I've told him to his face. This is not the first time. Is that just because you knew his what like like what he was coming with? No, yeah, I guess what you had to do was hide your outside shoulder. Just don't let him get that. So don't get him. Don't so, let him get that clamp. So show in. show him the show him the square, yeah. and then last minute turn your shoulder and hide it away from him. Yeah, and he would try to get it. You know yeah. what I mean? But he couldn't get it, so you would have to block him like this. Yeah. But again, obviously, I'm just I'm just talking smack right now. You know what I mean? You yeah. never know what happens. But but he was a huge part of my development. And yeah. so uh, Pittsburgh had an incredible uh, offensive line: Marquise Pouncey, Marcus Gilbert, Ron Foster, yep. David DeCastro. They were coach and Munch. Coach and Munch. You and guys so, were at the top of the league for a long time. Yes. Right? I, I hate what? rankings. You know, don't act, don't PFF me right now. You know We're not right? PFFing. We're just saying you're one of the better offensive lines in the league. Yeah. Press play. That's what I'm right. Travis is on record as saying that the only reason know, but you, PFF but, pays agents. Yeah, yeah, but there's everybody knows that Collinsworth. Right, right, but but what I, what I, <laughs> but what I, well, I think I think what I'm saying is the offensive line was very established and they were very mature and they had a culture of work that was uh, that was established through incredible leaders and yeah. because of that I was able to identify some of the the, the, the common themes in the military, work hard, and uh, and and fortunately and unfortunately. You know, my whole goal, you know, obviously, you know, we talked about business school. When I was in practice squad, all I was doing was applying to business schools. Yeah. Getting my GMAT. I had to get my GMAT done like 37 times to be able to get into Carnegie Mellon, which was, you know, in Pittsburgh. Yeah. And, and start my MBA. And so during the weekends, I was doing my homework, you know, when Kelvin Beecham was getting ready. Yeah, when Kelvin Be- can, can't work one job. You got to work two. You're a two job kind of guy. But I never thought I was going to make it in the NFL. You know, I, I never, I never thought for one. Even when you stopped James Harrison in practice, you're like, nah. Yeah, I was always like, because here's the here's a, the reality about the NFL is that you get labeled as an undrafted guy. Yeah, it's not the same as being a drafted. No, guy. Yeah, it's that. hard to, it's hard. You got to do above and beyond to break. Yeah, and break it, through. Right. So I'm 26 by the time I start. Like for you, if Kelvin Beecham never gets hurt, if you don't get that opportunity, maybe who knows, right? No, but not, not only Kelvin Beecham gets hurt. 
Mike Adams, who went to Ohio State, yeah. also got hurt. So two guys in front of me get hurt right. in order for me to have a chance to play. Yep. You know, I, 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 ne I never, it was never in my plans to play in the NFL. I just wanted one year salary, which back then was $480,000 right right. to be able to pay for business school and then move on with my life. That was my only goal out of the NFL. I didn't want anything out of the NFL other than paying for business school. It just so happened that Pittsburgh had an amazing business school right there and there uh, in Carnegie Mellon. And so I, that, that's all I cared about. On the yeah. weekends when Kevin Beachin is uh, studying the playbook and doing the tests and all of that, I was doing my homework and I was, yeah. and I was getting ready for, for, for Monday in class. But unfortunately, one day he gets hurt, you know, he gets hurt and playing against the Cardinals. And it's like one of those like, hey, Al, come on, let's go. And I'm and that's when the, oh my God. Oh, oh, this is God. happening. I got to go. This in. is happening. It's like when you Who get to it? the was top that, of the room. Was Chandler Jones there? It was Dwight Freeney. Ooh, and Calais like a, Campbell. The human hurricane. Gosh, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so, rough first start. A hundred percent. Did you get a nice inside spin? One hundred percent. I got the spin. I got it. Now remember, it's hilarious because when you go in there, you know. Like it's coming. From, You're like, hey, I'm going to hide this outside show. Whoa. <laughs> no, 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 no. I remember I remember going into the field. It was Coach Tomlin, Munchak, Todd Haley going like, he's got an inside spin. You know, I was like, I got, I got, I got inside spin. I got it. I got it. And sure enough, first third down, inside spin. You know, fortunately, like every quarterback, you know, like every office lineman say, like, balls out. You know, yeah, balls right. Out. Balls out, baby. Uh, and so that was, that was getting out. Yeah. Well, yeah. So that was my first start. Heard that play call. And then... <laughs> And then after that, I started the rest of the season. It was incredible because we made a, a, a good playoff run. And I thought that year we were going to win the Super Bowl. Had it not been for Peyton Manning giving himself up, standing up, and converting a third down, which I think later got changed. I think it's the Peyton Manning rule now. There's a Peyton Manning rule? I think if you give yourself up as a quarterback, you give yourself as a quarterback. Yeah. Because I think, I think either James Harrison or somebody was about to sack him or uh, William Gay on a blitz was about to sack him. Yes. But Peyton Manning gave himself up. Like he went down to the ground. Yeah. So he was the, oh, so he went down. All right. As long as he went down to the ground. No, no. He went down as in like, don't, please don't murder me. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the nickel um, uh, backer just kind of like ran by him. And then he stood up. And <laughs> oh, so they didn't blow it dead. They didn't blow it dead. And it was the fourth quarter. We're about to win the game. So he, Kenny Pickett did it. He I like did like the he fake, did the fake slide. Fake slide. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know this what Kenny Pickett did. Yeah, yeah. Peyton. Oh man, yeah. I didn't know this, that was the Peyton. But man that move. year was like hey, we, heads up play, Peyton. Yeah. Tell you what, they didn't touch you. But that year was incredible <laughs> because I, my first year as a starter, we got a chance. I got a chance to play against Demarcus Ware. I got a chance to play against incredible football players, and so, you know, it, it, it was it was a really cool process to be able to go from you know I'm, I'm trying to play in the NFL so I can pay for business school to yeah. like now I got to hide the fact that I'm going to business school because I don't want anybody to think like are you really paying as much yeah, attention to the football focused. field yeah you're not focused and why not you don't want to start a podcast or anything right 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 all right before we pass up Pittsburgh you played for Mike Tomlin for seven years seven years yeah what was uh what was that like Mike Tomlin is is a one of a kind I think sometimes. Sometimes I get a little pissed off when I see him because I know that he can have a much bigger role in society than being a head coach. Mm. You know, he's got incredible leadership skills, incredible charisma. And Mike Tomlin selling himself short? No, 100% he's selling himself short. 100%, <laughs> you know, that's for sure. But I think he sees people for, you know, where they're from. Mm -hmm. He's He was a college, uh, he, he appreciates and he values when coaches have been to college. Because not only have they been able to coach a player when they have no one else. You know, if you're a coach in the NFL, you say, like, draft me another center. You know what I mean? Sure. Coach Tomlin was somebody who believed in coaching. And he believed in being a part of your success story. You know, and so for me, obviously, you know, I, I can attest to that. Yeah. Uh, but he's also incredibly interested in, in, in geography and where people are from within the United States. Right. And so because of that, I was always extremely fascinated. You know, you could say that guy comes from Georgia. He played in the SEC. He achieved a lot of success. The transition to the NFL is going to be X, you know. And yeah. so that to me was 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 incredibly fascinating. And, um, you know, I had an incredible relationship with him. Helped me out tremendously. He wants to be part of your dream and the vision that you have for yourself. And so for me, was 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 an amazing, amazing, amazing time to be able to spend time with with somebody as, as, as remarkable and as, and as fascinating as Coach yeah. Tomlin. I mean, I've had a few conversations with him and I I know everybody speaks to the absolute world of him, man. So Coach Tomlin, we're gonna need you to run for president. So hundred percent. Jason, you wanna touch yeah, on Yeah, let's get so you know, football career obviously is an incredible part of your journey, but the beginning, I guess, of your football career at was that Army, right? Is that the first time you played football? No, so this is hilarious. I went to the most fascinating high school, I think. I mean, obviously, you, 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 both of you went to probably successful high school, Prime <laughs> Kings and <laughs> all that to, stuff. Come to Cleveland Heights, baby. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. It's pretty fascinating. 5-5. Five, five. It's the best, best record I had in high school. Yeah? Yeah, I think we mine, was, we, mine was... We, we had a lot of talent. 
Mine was five. Good kids. I, was, good kid. I was a long snapper on that team. Keep going. I went to I went to high school in Belgium. So I actually high school I, I did a year in the Canary Islands, a year in Rota Naval Station, and then my last two years I was in in Belgium at a high school called Shape. It stands for Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, and it was an American high school for all NATO kids. Mm-hmm. So all the kids that were in my class were from all the different NATO countries. So I would have NATO. a German kid next to my, you know, sitting next to me. Is NATO going over his head right now? Do you know what NATO? NATO. I don't even want to do this. It's got to be an acronym, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is is an acronym. So my high school experience was incredible. And and obviously it's what led to me deciding to come to the United States. Discovering football was also when I discovered Europe. So I got a chance to go to the Vatican. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Watching the Chappelle show for the first time on a portable DVD player. At the Vatican? They're playing it at the Vatican? No, no, no. But I'm seeing like, like when we're on the bus. <laughs> Which episode? We're watching, all of them. You know, all Louses. of them. All of them. I mean, for me, for me it was, it, I was, I was discovering American culture. Yeah. And then I was discovering all of Europe. Mm-hmm. He and started to discover American culture through Dave Chappelle. Through Dave Chappelle, yeah. This is fucking awesome. A hundred percent. It was incredible. It's coming in hot. And so for me, it was amazing to, 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 to see Western culture through, through this high school, you know, to travel all throughout Europe. I guess football was like a, a way, a medium for me to, to get to know American culture. And then obviously when I went to West Point, it was the same way because in West Point, you have an, a, a, a fairly equal representation of the United States within each graduating class. So you go right to West Point. Why'd you go to West Point? Yeah, so it's interesting. So I, I, you know, I had a Euro mullet when I was in high school. A Euro mullet? Yeah. I've never even is heard that term. Is there a difference from the Euro mullet than the... The Euro mullet is not as... Just have gel in it? No, no. The you Euro mullet is not as back? is not as, is not as as obscene, maybe, as the American 80s mullet. Gotcha. Oh. It's more like the soccer player mullet. You yeah, know it's I mean? a little more styled up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I had, you know... I, 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 Classier mullet. Right. Classier, I, yeah. I, I, I didn't speak English very well. Obviously, my mind was, you know, I, I, I was European, you know, like I was, I was, I was, I was centered around, you know, European culture and whatnot. And then when we played Naples, so we we took a trip, we stayed in a gym, and we were in the gym, and, and that was the time where people had the portable DVD players. Mm-hmm. There was a kid in, 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 on the football team, team captain, who was watching the movie Black Hawk Down, mm-hmm. and he was watching the movie, and he was in tears. He was just completely crying watching the movie, and I was like. You know, I've I've never, me personally, especially my family, like crying. You know, I know I know that, I know that maybe for the Kelsey's different, but like for, yeah. for me, crying is Big like, cars. yeah, like yeah. Why, why 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 are you crying? You know what yeah. I mean? This guy, man, uh, he said something I'll never forget. You know, I was like, I, like, you know, why are you crying? You know, watching a movie that happened in 1991 or whatever Somali happened, and he said, you know, I, I'm sad and upset because I cannot be there to help him. You know, mm-hmm. he's watching a movie and he's suffering because he cannot be there to help him. Yeah. So then I started realizing, you know, the the, the sentiment that the people that join the military have, which is very different from the rest of the world in the sense that it's an all-volunteer force. You know, people volunteer to be in the United States military. And that's a huge concept because a lot of militaries have aristocracies or, or families that are into the military and then the kids join the military. But in America, it's anybody, you know? It's mandatory service or right. whatever it is, yeah. And so uh, my math teacher, who's one of my favorite uh, teachers from Pittsburgh as well, you know, he told me, you know, I, I was getting I was getting looked at to play basketball, to play to play football uh, in the United States, and he said, "Don't go to college to play sports. You know, play sports to go to college." Sure. For me, it was really difficult to understand this concept because most European sports are not played in college. Mm-hmm. You know, they're played at a club level, mm-hmm. but athletes have to give up their education to play sports. Wow. But in the United States, it's paired up. In the United States, you know, I know the NCAA and the NIA is, is a little bit controversial, and you know, you, you can argue that in a thousand different ways. But the fact that they're educating athletes is a huge advantage in life. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it was an opportunity to be able to go into an amazing school if I was willing to serve. And so I went to uh, both the Naval Academy and the uh, Military Academy. Always wanted to be a Marine. A Marine was my dream. You know, I always wanted to be the few, the proud, the Marine. So you went to the Naval first? I went to the Naval Academy first. Okay. They barely, you know, they were like, yeah, yeah. You know, they knew where Rota Naval Station was because mm-hmm. Rota is a Naval Station. So they were very familiar with where I was from. And they were like, yeah, you know, for, to play college football, you got to be like an athlete. You know, this is not something you just sign up for and whatnot. So they were not very welcoming, you know, in, 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 during, during my visit. But then I just drove up all the way to West Point and West Point was incredibly welcoming. And I think one of the traits about the army is that in the army, you truly have to know where your soldiers are from. 
not only do you have to love them, but you have to know everything about them in order to love them. And so they were extremely interested about where I was from. They were very interested about my background. I got a chance to spend a night with a, you know, a player who volunteered to, to host me for the night. And I know that most college host, you know, sort of events are like crazy and parties. But dude, we just sat in a laptop and we watched videos of the Iraq war, you know. And he was telling me how excited he was to join the army so he can fight alongside his brothers. And so at that moment, I found a cause and I said, you know what? He told me about the Ranger Regiment. He told me about the Ranger culture. He told me about the United States Army. He told me about all the different divisions, the infantry, whatnot. And at that moment, I saw it. I was like, okay, you know what? This is the second time that I see this. If people are so committed to serving, and they're committed to serving in this type of way, you know, sticking their face in the fan. I don't care if I'm 6'10", you know, I, I, I'm going to do this. And so when I was 17 years old, I applied. I got accepted. Uh, and then I just took a flight one day, landed into Newark wink at the Statue of Liberty on my way in and I and I started at West Point. Mm -hmm. And so that was that was the, so sort of my, my adventure into the Americas with the same mentality of like, you know, there's there's no coming back from this. You know, I'm coming here and I'm gonna make my future. I don't know anybody in this country. Uh, I'm gonna try to make the best out of it. And in the infantry, the Rangers, the culture of, of 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 being able to be in the front lines at the tip of the spear was always something that was very, very much in the in, in, in the forefront of, of of my thoughts. And it was a different time as well. You know, I, I have to recognize, you know, back between the ages of 2006, 2010, when I was at the academy, between all the alpha males at West Point, there was a race to get to combat. It wasn't that people were shying away from combat. People were trying to get to combat yeah. be before the war was over. And so thankfully I had a good enough class rank to select the unit of my choice. So I was drafted, you know, to the, mm. to the, to the, to the division that I wanted, which is 10th mountain division. Why'd you want to go there? Because I got a tip hours before I selected that unit that they were going to get reassigned from Iraq into Afghanistan. And they were going to go to Zari district in Kandahar, which was the, the most kinetic place in the war. And so I said, I got to be in 10th mountain division. 10th mountain division is one of the units that deploys the most. Also one of the units in, uh, in Black Hawk down. Yeah. And so, you know, I said, I'm um, 10th Mountain Division, it is. Upstate New York, not an ideal place for most, uh, you know, cadets. Usually they want to go to Italy. They want to go to places that are a little fun. But I wanted to go to 10th Mountain Division because I knew they would deploy. So I graduated in, in May. I took a, a couple weeks of leave. Shortened my leave in order to accomplish all my training as fast as possible because I knew that they were deploying in March. And I completed all my training, uh, infantry basic officer leadership course, Ranger uh, leadership course, airborne school, and then I showed up to my unit and I deployed a week later. Man, that's awesome. It's crazy, right? That's awesome. But it's not, it's not that crazy when you take into account that everybody was trying to do that. I was just able to well, maneuver. Everybody in your circle. Everybody in the inner circle of West Point, yeah. class of 2010, which is that's when I graduated. What, yeah. They were all trying to go. You said that that was one of the most kinetic areas. What do you mean? But like what made that area... Like, yeah, so it's such a center point, yeah, I guess, so, in Afghanistan. So Afghanistan is an interesting country called the Graveyard, the graveyard of Empires. It's been a, a country that has been trying to, you know, pe many empires have tried to conquer it, Afghanistan throughout, throughout the ages. It sits in the middle between Asia and Europe in one of these, you know, these quote-unquote you know, trade routes, you yeah. know, between the two. So it's always been a very uh, natural area of interest for all empires to control sort of the center of the chess table. Sure. You know, and Kandahar is one of the oldest cities in uh, Western culture. It was founded officially, I guess, by Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great named it after him, like many other cities throughout, uh, you know, his territory. So Kandahar actually comes from Iskandar, you know, which is how you pronounce Alexander in their language. And from, is, and from Iskandar, you develop Kandahar. And so Kandahar is actually the de facto capital of Afghanistan in the sense that it does have the most influence in the culture of Afghanistan. So Afghanistan is a country that is divided into many different tribes, many different, uh, you know, uh, uh, areas, um, uh, ethnic groups. The Pashtuns are the ethnic group that was uh, generating the most amount of insurgents. Mm -hmm. They were protecting the terrorists that we were going after. And Kandahar was sort of the de facto capital. So Mullah Omar, who's the founder of the Taliban, was from the village that I was in, from Zari district. Yeah. And so because of that, obviously, it was a, a tremendous uh, stronghold for the Taliban that they had to, they had to hold, they had to uh, maintain. A lot of variables influenced this, the fact that they were very close to Pakistan. So just like in Vietnam, you know, being able to uh, go in the summer 
conduct attacks on U.S. forces and then retreat back to Pakistan where they're safe, uh, made Kandahar and all the provinces that were on the border with, uh, with Pakistan the most kinetic areas, meaning there was the most amount of incidents where you have attacks on, on sure. ISAF forces. And you, you were there for how many months? First deployment was 12 months, and then, and then I deployed to RCE. So the, the way that the United States divided Afghanistan was into regional commands. So you have a regional command south. Uh, I'm looking at Travis's face right now. <laughs> I'm not much different than him, dude. No, no, this no, is no. completely new to me. I'm, I know it's, well, then you're, yeah, <laughs> you're doing better than me. So, they, so the, the, you know, when the United States uh, invaded Afghanistan and they, yeah. they started conducting operations, they divided the, the country into regional commands. So yeah. regional command south, and uh, I think involved Zabul, Kandahar, Helmand province, maybe Herat. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about Herat. RC East was all the provinces that were on the eastern border, uh, Konar, uh, Paktika, Khos, Ghazni, uh, Wardak, RC North. So you have, you, you have, you have different areas of, of the country that you could be assigned to. Sure. Just so, think of it as a chessboard. Remember the, the middle of the chessboard, the east, south. Just think of it like that. Right, right, right. So my first deployment was to RC South, and that's the desert. So the desert is, you know, I, I, could, be, I could be a weatherman for Afghanistan right now. It's going to be 110 degrees every single day and sunny, you know. And, hey. it, and, it's, and it's, there's not it a single... Sounds fun. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a desert, but, but, it, but it is incredibly interesting. You know, you the guys first, get to wear tank tops if it's too... No, hard? no, no. You're wearing uniform, you're sweating <laughs> as much as you can. Yeah. You start actually questioning whether... I mean, I remember, again, pseudoscience, you know, like the whole, thing, I the love whole thing about like drinking water, you know, I always thought that the whole thing about drinking water was all promoted by bottled water companies and Gatorade and whatnot. You just think you didn't need to drink water. If you drink a lot of water, you're going to be sweating a lot. You're going to be losing a lot of water and you're going to be in incredibly uncomfortable. You know, the Afghans are not drinking water, you know, like, 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 like pounding water. So, so you're saying that we don't need to drink water. I did not drink as much water either when I was in the NFL playing. Or when I was in Afghanistan, because I did not want to sweat con consistently. Now, I, I know, I know, I got it, whatever. Yeah, go out to Afghanistan, put on 70 pounds of gear, long sleeve boots, and start doing patrols up and down for 14 hours. But Tom Brady said that sunburn is a direct result of dehydration. I don't get, I don't get sunburn, you know? I don't know about you guys. I don't get sunburned, but I can, yeah. you have a different I, complexion. Yeah. Right, right, right. I so I will get torched. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but Kandahar was 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 an incredible city, not only because of the history that I just mentioned. It's one of the oldest settlements of, of, of human civilization. But yeah. because they grew grapes, you know, and talk about the farming thing. How there they are the, grow grapes without water. Mm. The water comes from the mountains. Do you understand how grapes? God damn. The, yeah, well, that's, it's kind of like the Napa Valley, very, very similar. Yeah, have you you ever have the mountains out in the east, and all the water melts. The grapes are better when there's no rain. Your brother's teaching you right now, son. Are you, you're the fruit farmer too. He's Grow up, Jason. Yeah, you know, two on one. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but they had. They, there was a, it was an agricultural, uh, uh, you know, sort of you know, community. They grew pomegranates. They grew grapes on mm -hmm. the legal side, and then on the illegal side, they grew a lot of marijuana and they grew a lot of opiates. So I remember you showing me a picture. Right. Of a marijuana plant taller than you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I took way too many marijuana pictures when I was over there. Yeah. I mean, it was a pretty impressive marijuana plant. Yeah, yeah. The, the, like I, it, it's like when you you take the pumpkin to the state fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a marijuana plant you take to the state <laughs> yeah, fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it was a big one. I'm not going to lie. I get a lot of street credit from my life when I was showing videos and you're walking through fields that are miles and miles long of nothing but marijuana plants. And yeah. they get hash out of that. It supplies, you know, all the European markets. Uh, but Kandahar was a very fascinating city. I mean, the first thing you notice is it kind of looks like the Bible. You know, it's, 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 it looks just, I mean, houses are made out of mud. People live very, you know, rustic sort of lives, you know, except for cell phones, you know, and motorcycles. You know, you would think that you're in, you know, Abraham's time. So. Yeah. So you, did, you ended up doing three tours in Afghanistan. In what ways did that, like, transform you into, like, who you are today, I guess? Every infantryman, every person that goes into Afghanistan, especially for the first time, they have this romanticized idea of what it's like to be a soldier. Mm -hmm. You know, you do have this idea of all the movies that you've watched that you're going to make a huge difference, that you're going to be... Rambo. You're gonna, but not even Rambo, but you're going to be doing something for your country that is going to um, or have a direct relationship with the safety of, of those that are back home, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And then when you get to Afghanistan, you realize that it's a lot more complex. And nothing is what it seems, you know. I mean, just to give you a perspective, right now we're having a relationship with the Taliban. 
you know, yeah. we supply them and we we try to help them. And, and 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 you don't know who's a good guy, you don't know who's a bad guy. The people from Afghanistan always had the backs of the Taliban. The Taliban is is, is their sons and, and and daughters, well not daughters, but their sons, you know. And and it was very frustrating to be able to go to a country where your mission was to protect the people from Zari district and everything that you do. And then get to a country where you're not being welcome or they're not cooperating with the information, where you feel like, hold on a minute, so you guys don't want us to be here, you know, liberating you guys from the, from the Taliban? My first deployment was very frustrating in, in, in that sense. You know, we were what's called a battle space owner. So we had a uh, we had an area of operations. In my case, it was the, it was it was San Jure Village. We had a cop that was around Highway 1, and we conducted operations, you know, daily out of the cop. And, you know, at first you're just trying to be like, hey, you know, we're going to deny the Taliban freedom of movement. We know there's a lot of Taliban going around here. We're going to get getting kicked out of here, you know. But then you realize that the people from the city of Sandra are, you know, you know, hosting these people and they're helping and they're giving them information. And so then, then you start questioning, okay, so, 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 so what, what are we doing here? And then, and then you, you, you stand up the Afghan National Police and the Afghan National Army and you realize that their motivations are, are not aligned with what you're trying to do. You hear from politicians that you're not there to nation build. You know, that was one of the biggest things that they always, you know, said you're not here to nation build. But we were nation building, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So you're not trained to nation build. You know, you're trained to conduct fire drills and you conduct a, you're trained to do, uh, you know, maneuver on the enemy and whatnot. And that's not at all what we were doing. And so that, that, that then kills a little bit of your romantic dream, uh, you know, of the things that you were going to be doing. Then again, you start understanding a little bit of more like how the United States operates. So you understand that very quickly that almost the majority of people that you see in Afghanistan are military contractors. They're not people in uniform you know, with a U.S. flag. They're military contractors that are contracted uh, because it's cheaper for the United States government to contract somebody than to give them benefits for, for life. Wow. And so when you start seeing that, then you start questioning, Man. you know, what, 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 what are the effort, you know, are we all aligned on a, on a clear objective? And when you start seeing the amount of money that is being generated and the amount of money that is being made, you know, by, by defense contractors, then you start questioning whether everybody's on the same page, you know? And a lot of people maybe are not, you know, as, as interested in, in, in finishing the war or, or having a clear strategy. And I think that was the one of the biggest themes is that you didn't think that there was a clear strategy to come up with a, 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 a decisive win. A solution, you know? yeah. yeah. Positive yeah, outcome. in football, whoever's got the most points wins. Mm -hmm. But the biggest question in Afghanistan was, what does winning look like? You know, what does winning in Afghanistan look like? What, 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 what is, what is going to look like in the end? And I thought, you know... After I served one of the training camps, you know, the caster and I used to watch documentaries during training camp, and we watched the Vietnam documentary by Ken Burns, which is one of the greatest documentaries that I've ever seen. And you watch that there was a lot of the same themes, you know, between the Vietnam War and Afghanistan, and how in the end, the relationship that we have with Vietnam over the years was able to sort of, you know, even after the war, you know, you were able to establish a, a good relationship with with the country of Vietnam. And so, even though it didn't look like a win, you know, for the American people, in the end, it, it, it was it was very positive. So maybe as a veteran, I'm waiting for that end result, you know, that we will have a good relationship with Afghanistan in the future, however it looks, that I will be able to go back with my boys, you know, when, when I'm older and I'm able to, to go hike the mountains of Afghanistan. That would be incredible. But you know, especially in, in the last few years when the war ended, when you saw those images of people climbing out, climbing out to the plains, it was not an easy pill to swallow. You know, the fact that you've you've done all this, that you that you have, you were completely, you know, devoted to, to, to this cause, and it did not ended up panning out like you thought it would when you were 21 years old. So, you know, a, a, a lot of interesting concepts about how the military, the U.S. military operates. And I, it's crazy because I was born out of that sort of cause. You know, the yeah. United States sells weapons and, and aircraft to, to, to NATO countries. And then those pilots have to come to the United States to train. And that's how I was born, you know. So yeah. it is kind of like a full circle sort of, uh, you know, situation, scenario. But, um, you know, very unfortunate. You know, I, I feel extremely passionate about all the soldiers who lost their lives in the war in Afghanistan. I also feel extremely uh passionate about the loss of life and the loss of of of, of, of a way of life that, that that we caused and we inflicted and the people from afghanistan you know and so ultimately i think americans have extremely romantic ideals but the reality is a lot more complicated than than than, than those you know um you know black hawk down saving private ryan type of um you know yeah. moments that that, that that motivate you to, to to do something good yeah i appreciate you sharing jesus that, man that's all right well Let's bring this down a little bit. <laughs> um, you became a ranger 
how does one become a ranger? So there's actually two sort of versions of a ranger. So the rangers were an all-volunteer force during World War II. They were created, and again, you know, I'm not a history major, but I think they were, and I have to know this at one point, but they were... So I think, you're a West Point major. I'm a West Point major, yeah, yeah. So they were, they were established in Ireland, you know? So before, you know, if you watch the movie Seven Private Ryan, those were rangers. They were mm -hmm. all-volunteer soldiers who became part of a, a, a unit that was that was tasked to do a different type of mission sets. Okay. And so the Rangers have an incredible history and incredible reputation, quiet professionals. They're not about making movies and being on podcasts, you know, with what, Which ones are you? You're not going to name names, though? Of who? Of the, 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 what regiment is about making movies? It's not about a regiment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. But, uh, you know, all, all jokes aside, yeah. all units in the military are incredibly different and unique in their own ways. But the, the Rangers are a very specific an interesting unit because they both serve, especially as an officer, in the conventional army, and then they also serve in the Ranger Regiment. So they go back and forth. And the and the charter of the of, of the of the Rangers is to be able to bring the values, the techniques, and the tactics from the Ranger Regiment into the big army. Mm -hmm. So Ranger, uh, the Ranger Regiment, you know, Ranger culture created a Ranger school, which mm -hmm. is a uh, you know, if, if you go straight through, it's a three month course leadership course where they put you into a lot of different uh, stress situations. They teach you how to patrol and they evaluate you on that and it gives you the ranger tab. And then if you want to join a ranger uh, unit, then you have to go through uh, RASP, which is Ranger Assessment and Selection Process. Uh, it takes place in Fort Benning, Georgia, and then you become a member of a ranger uh, of a ranger unit. You know, So we currently have three regiments and a, and a, and a support training battalion. Uh, First Ranger Battalion out of uh, Savannah, Georgia, Hunter Mayor Field. Second, Second Ranger Battalion out of Fort Lewis, uh, Washington, and Third Ranger Battalion in uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Yeah. And so for me, you know, they, they, they're not a big unit, but during the years of the war, they rotated every four months. So every four, you know, four months you deployed, eight months you're home, four months you deployed. And so for me, it was the fastest way to get back to being a, a leader in combat. And so yeah. that's why I wanted to go join the Rangers. And was it at Fort Benning? Where you get hunted for like what a week or something like that, where they have to you have to try and not get caught. No, what no, is, that, that's in uh, that's in Fort Rucker. That's Fort uh, Rucker. Okay. yeah, yeah. That's the, that's the training they do, especially for pilots and, <clears throat> and for and for people that are in situations where you where you you know you have to resist you know torture and and, and all, all sorts yeah. Of things. Yeah. Did you have to do that? No, no, no. I did not do. Oh, that. Did, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I did ranger school, airborne school. Six ten, trying to hide, man. <laughs> Good luck. It, 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 can, it can happen. Yeah. All right. Well. Let's get to the, uh, you don't have to answer, but we got to ask. Go, go ahead. Now. I'm going to answer all of them. Here we go. Alejandro, this is the segment where we actually ask you questions that you don't have to answer. First one, did you really teach Juju Smith-Schuster how to drive? I did not teach Juju Smith-Schuster how to drive. He's an excellent uh, video game player. <laughs> but I did teach him and I did help him get his driver's license because he was still in the LA mentality that he can Uber everywhere. When in reality, he, you know, he had to go through the process of being able to get a, a driver's license. That's crazy. I didn't know that. <laughs> did you get the Steelers to use the quote dilly dilly from the Bud Light commercials? I did. You did? Well, how, how'd that come about? So as you both know, because you guys are both offensive players, Cadence is like an offensive tackle's best friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you have an experienced offensive line, if you hear Monday, January, Alpha. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right, yeah. It's going to be a one. And so we're trying. Don't give it out to the D linemen that don't yeah, know yeah, this. Dude, yeah. if, you're an office, if you're a defensive lineman and you hear Monday, 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 yeah. you know, and you have a, a player from San Diego State who's a rookie, you know, coming in from the practice squad, it's a one. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sorry I ruined the NFL season for both of you. Yeah, we've got to change our one <laughs> yeah. count now. We don't uh, but yeah, no. So we were the, the commercial was going on. It was hilarious, and, and Ben Ben like the 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 whole daily daily thing. So we used it, and I think I guess it became viral because they're, they're, they're taping all the. It was a Thursday night game, I think, and, and then we used the daily daily. Yeah, we actually did. Uh, we did Philly Philly for uh, the Philly special play. Oh, cool, tight. Was it an illegal play? Um, perhaps. I mean, they didn't call it so. Okay, cool. It's legal. Who complains more, troops or uh, football players? Offensive linemen complain. <laughs> so it. It's the only way we can get through life. It's you know? it's a miserable position. A hundred percent. There's no yeah. upside. You know, there's zero upside. The, the the upside is you do your job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, the upside. The is downside like, is you get crushed in front yeah, of the. Yeah, they're only going to show. They're not going to show you when you score a touchdown. They're going to show you when you give a penalty, when you make yeah. a mistake. You know, so in order to. You know, utilize defense mechanisms, you're going to complain. The most it's a life of, of misery. 100%. So I only know, you know, offensive and, linemen and stuff. So and the best way to bond is through shared misery. 100%. But soldiers complain a lot too. So I don't know. Maybe I won't have to answer that one because they both complain a lot. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a both. 
I'm a PhD complainer. Which complaints are more warranted, soldiers or offensive linemen? Uh, soldiers, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 100%. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Going back to the conversation that we had earlier, I did yeah. feel one of the things about the you know the war that I, that I felt the most guilty about yeah. was standing in front of my men when they would ask questions like, sir, what are we doing here? And have to give them like a political speech. Sure. You know, as to all the things that we were doing, yeah. empty promises and whatnot. And so... Uh, I think their complaints are more warranted and they carry a little more weight, for sure. Makes sense. Um, this is a huge controversy uh, in the world, but mostly on this show. How many holes does a straw have? Two. <laughs> this is fucking... Did you just count the ends or did you actually think about it? I mean, I counted what's, what's the definition of a hole and how many of that, you know, applies I'm with to you. The, Listen, to you're, the we're, we're in the uh, same These are supposed to be really quick questions, so we'll keep moving. Uh, <laughs> do, you believe, <laughs> do you believe that you don't need to use body wash when taking a shower? Dude, I'm the worst person to... I'm an organic farmer. You know what I mean? <laughs> So I uh, I don't use I I you know you just told me you don't use deodorant I don't use deodorant I don't brush my teeth I don't do you don't brush your teeth the whole brushing your teeth you don't even drink water is that yeah this conspiracy the brushing so you don't need water and you don't need to brush your teeth why is it why is it that nine out of ten dentists recommend like what's up what's up with a one dentist I'm with you I'm a big one one time and because it doesn't make sense to brush in the morning I felt you haven't eaten anything all night I get brushing at night dude I felt I have no I have zero cavities zero everything I don't go to the dentist I mean you know was the was the you got good genetics, Alejandro. Yeah, well, maybe, also, maybe that's what it is. But yeah. I, I did feel when you come to the United States that everything is consumerism and trying to yeah. sell you something. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. And yeah. brushing your teeth, using deodorant, all that yeah. stuff is just bottle water. I think it's just things that are trying to sell you and then create a, a marketing campaign behind it to say like you got to brush your teeth three times a day. You know. Speaking of that, if you guys are looking for extra energy, you guys need to check out Accelerator. <laughs> that's the natural way to take in energy and caffeine. Thermogenics. Plant-based, thermogenics. Yeah, I did want to ask one more. What is a harder transition, leaving the military or leaving the NFL? So I feel like most people decide to become a soldier right before high school. Yeah. You know, when they look at their choices, very, very few service members always knew that they want to become a soldier. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm obviously inculcating that into my son. He will become an urban ranger. He has no choice, you know. But people decide to become a football player from a very early age. You know, and I've noticed that. I've noticed that their identity becomes a football player. So I've seen pictures of you, both of you, and your little pads, like, ah, you know what I mean? The Kelsey brothers. Ah, look, at let's talk about the Kelsey brothers one more time, facing each other in the Super Bowl. Ah, you know? <laughs> Most players. So you were sick of it, too. Got it. Exactly. I, <laughs> by the way, I've been, I've been to both your Super Bowl wins. So you're coming next year to Vegas, baby. I don't know. You, you super, I'm not superstitious. I'm just a little stitches, you know. Well, I'm putting no, it on you. If I'm, I'm not there, I don't know if you're gonna win. No, no. I'm, uh, if but, I go, you got to take it now. So. But I have, I, I have felt that uh, NFL. You know, most people that play in the NFL, they started playing in pee wee football. Their identity was obviously when they went to college. They were not there for the academics. Yeah. yeah. And they were just there to to, to, to play college football. Not and in then, the Kelsey household, Jason, maybe, yeah, Jason maybe. went for academics for sure. To college? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't think that's accurate. So maybe for you it's an easy transition. But for a lot of players, they just, like, football is their only way yeah. in life. And so because of that, m most players in the in, in, in the Army do five years and then they get out. But in the NFL, man, you know, the, the, the journey to get to the NFL is, is extremely long. And when there's no longer football, it does become a very difficult transition into your identity. You know, people don't call you as much when you don't play because they, they don't need tickets. You know, mm. when they need tickets, they're calling you the whole time. Hey, Travis, how are you? You know, yeah. Like, uh, can I get three tickets for the Kansas City Chargers game? Yeah, come on. You know what I mean? Like, it's a, it's, it's a lot different when you transition out of the NFL in the sense that, you know, you, you, you definitely lose your quote-unquote fans, you know. But both of them are, are very similar in the sense that it is, you take away your uniform, you know. Mm. Maybe it's the Kansas City uniform, maybe it's the, the, the camel uniform, but, it, but it's a completely different life. And they're both very similar in the way that not only they resemble each other, you know, with, with, with how you practice and the things that we talked about, but also, you know, the, a change of identity. Now you got to become, like, pick it, you know, fruit farmer, right, fruit farmer, there you go. You got to find your fruit farmer boys, man. You got to get your bros in there. Right? I got no bros right now. All vegans, you know, they don't like the bro, the bro lifestyle, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Chugging beers and eating steak. They're in on the no deodorant, though. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> Last thing before we wrap up, Alejandro, we want you to be a part of our favorite segments. No dumb questions because there's no dumb questions, just dumb people. Okay. Uh, no dumb questions is brought to you by our friends at Accelerator. It's right there. Trav has some mm. from Eva on Twitter. What is your Mount Rushmore of summer activities, like at a barbecue? So I think what she's going for is things that you would do at a barbecue, not 
like go to the beach or something like that? Uh, at a barbecue. So I, I'm not a summer barbecue. That's 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 a that's a very American concept. So I'm, I'm not no barbecue in Spain. No, no, there's not as much barbecue. There's no shrimp on the on the barbie. No, the bar bar <laughs> barbecue. Barbecue. The, the the concept of of the Fourth of July taking a weekend off to go back to work in your summer job. I mean, Europeans take June, July, August off. You just told me how excited you were to celebrate Fourth of July over in Spain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was you got to have a barbecue over. Okay, in Spain. barbecue. So I like to. Uh, uh, barbecue, so uh, like cornhole, cornhole, yep, mm -hmm. okay, spike ball, spike Ooh. ball. I will put spike ball above anything else. Okay, really, uh, I'm a big spike, spike ball, ball guy. guy. I'm a huge spike ball guy. What's the strategy of spike ball? Because I, I, I can't really understand it. This well. is a surf. You've never played. Other than getting the ball to the net, I don't. Is a surf. The surf. Everything is. It's surf. a lot of movement for a big fellow. No, 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 no. no. I play spike ball, and I was bigger Dude. than you. Really? It, yeah, you can. It, spike ball is the funnest game in the world, behind ping pong, maybe. Like, I would have thought you were so in pong. on spike ping ball. Ping pong is the best. Ping pong is the go. I like pickleball more than ping pong. <laughs> I'm more of a table tennis guy. Table tennis, ping pong. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Do you know the uh, I would say. Um, I thought it was. Di Never mind. I, I like to be in the barbecue first of all. You like to be the the barbecuer. I like to wear, you know, sandals. Yeah. Do you, do you wear like a uh, apron? No, shirtless. Duh. Tongs? Mm, spatula. Spatula. Yeah. Burgers. Uh, so I like the I like to be the guy in the grill. Do you like barbecue sauce? Uh, no. Can't. So what do you put on your meats? K ketchup. Is that is that barbecue sauce? No, I mean, well, um, Kansas City based barbecue sauce is Kansas based in City. Ketchup. Now I got love Kansas City. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, burger is cheese, burger, ketchup, buns. Yeah, but if you're making, do you ever make ribs? Are we talking about like, oh, so that's not, I'm thinking about like an easy, simple barbecue. Are we talking Hot about dogs, like, burgers. You want to talk about smoking something? You want to talk about like, 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 like smoking a pig? And yeah. now, okay, yeah, smoking a pig, yeah, for sure. That's all, yeah, yeah. So Mount Rushmore is pickleball? No, no, spike pickleball. Ball. No, spike ball. Spike, pick a, no, spike, spike, spike ball. Spike ball. Spike ball. Cornhole. Cornhole. Barbecue man. Barbecue. We're missing one more. What's the, like, pool? I can shoot pool, yeah. No, no, like, like, pool. Like, not billiards. Like jumping in a pool. I'll be in the pool? Mm hmm. Like is that like a barbecue? Yeah, I guess. Uh -huh. I mean, shotgun and beers. Can we put shotgun beers? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll put yeah, that I mean, on my mouth. Put, uh, put shotgun and beers before. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. Is it before spike ball or spike ball beating shotgun and beers? Oh, these are not dumb questions. These are incredibly complicated questions. Yeah. Uh, I have to win a spike ball. I have to be the king. I have to make I gotta people. I got to try this spike ball thing. A hundred percent spike ball. I can't ball believe you haven't got dope. I think I've played it. We used to play it in the locker room. I used to play, used in, the play in the locker room. My my teammate was Chase Claypool. It was my my he was my my teammate. Probably Spike a good ball. teammate. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Incredibly athletic range, and we used to play during COVID year, which is the funnest year in NFL history. You know, mm -hmm. we used to play we Spike ball for hours before practice. Hours. What's the strategy to Spike ball? To surf. The surf. The surf. I thought the surf had to be nice and easy. So no, no, no. Obviously, that's that's number one. But the, but the, but then if you make the surf too easy, the other team is going to score right away. So yeah. you have to make the surf as complicated. You have to play game theory. You know, you have to threaten to make a really hard serve, mm -hmm. and then do it like a little, a little lay. Yeah. So then so then they're like really far away. They can make it. But the serve is ninety percent of spike ball and psychology. I Meaning you have to you have to intimidate your teammates, your 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 opposing team. How do you intimidate in spike ball? Dude, personal stuff. Aggressive spike. Oh, wow. So you're yeah, trash yeah. talking. Yeah, personal. You go personal. What's the best way to get in somebody's head trash talking? Uh, talk about... Girlfriends, wives, yeah, kids? Everything. All the above. Whatever makes them insecure. You keep trying until you find mm -hmm. it. Yeah. All righty. Well, dude, you're, you're the best. No, you're the best. Dude, um, the most interesting man in the world. There's no such thing. I appreciate you. No, there is, and you're him. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. I've never sat down with you and not been th thoroughly... Enthralled or whatever you're saying. Enthralled. That's just because I'm a great bullshitter. Yeah. I mean, we well, speak four other languages. And yeah. Did a whole bunch of things. Yes. Every, 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 every person is interesting. It's equally is interesting. I don't know about equally. Don't PFF me right I now. like. Dude. If I'm, your PFF rating on level of interest is a 99. No, nah, don't PFF me, bro. Yeah. It's, it's higher than Aaron Donald. No <laughs> way, bro. How much is Aaron Donald's agent paying? <laughs> <laughs> All righty. That about wraps up this episode of New Heights. Thank you to Alejandro Villanueva Woo! for sitting in with, with us this week. Make sure you're subscribed on YouTube to the New Heights channel so you know when all the new episodes are coming out. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, next week we will be releasing our special Ocean Drive episode, which will feature the New Heights Beer Bowl. Once again, New Heights is presented by Wave Sports and Entertainment and brought to you by our friends at Fireball. Fireball. Mm, a delicious cinnamon mm. delight. Do they, drink, do they drink Fireball in Spain? No. Oh, they're it's, it's America's out. number one shot, not Spain. Yeah, well, liquor is, I feel like, real American. <laughs> Follow the show on all social media. 
Follow the show on all social media platforms at New Heights Show with one S for fun clips throughout the week. And thanks to our production and crew. You guys are always making us look good. And thank you to all the 92 percenters for tuning in, baby. Enjoy your weekend, guys. Peace.